Great. Uh, and to hear, like, I would like to just start off by um, thanking Deputy Seamus Healy for allowing this bill to be taken on his allocation within the technical group of private members' time. To hear, like, apart from the elite few, no one has escaped the austerity. It has invaded every home, every classroom, every hospital, and all of our public services. Homelessness has reached more families than ever before, and our health care system is crumbling. Job opportunities have been reduced while work conditions have declined and our frontline services have been stretched so far beyond their limits, we may never know the full extent of the consequences. For the unfortunate few, economic recovery will never reach them. The government's sole fixes on fi focus on fixing an economic deficit has left us with a social one. Now amid some vague signs of, reco of economic recovery, we need to ensure that resources are fairly distributed into the future. The call to enshr enshrine economic, social and cultural rights is a timely one. A new government will still sit across this chamber, regardless of its compos composition, by the spring of next year. We want that government to be held accountable to its citizens as it reconstructs our future. We want it to ensure that everyone has enough to live a dignified life. When Bunrock na Heron was, in, was written in 1937, it was progressive in its time for its consideration of fundamental rights, having been written 11 years before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Today, only civil and political rights are adequately considered in our Constitution. For example, the right to privacy and family life, and there is limited provision made for economic, social and cultural rights in Bunrock na Heron. The proposed wording of the bill is intended to be in addition to the text of Article 45 of the Constitution, to the effect that the state shall progressively realise, subject to its maximum available resources and without discrimination, the rights contained in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and that this duty will be cognizable by the courts. The International Covenant presents economic rights as entailing the, the right of everyone to the opportunity to gain their living by freely cho chosen or accepted work and to just and favourable conditions of work. Social rights are expressed as the right to social security, protection and assistance of the family, the right of everyone to an adequate standard of living for them and their family, including food, clothing and housing, the continuous improvement of living conditions and the right to be free from hunger, the right of everyone to the highest available standards of physical and mental health, and the right of everyone to an education. And cult cultural rights would protect the right of everyone to take part in cultural life, to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress, and to benefit from the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, literary or artistic production of which he or she is the author. Enshrining these rights in the Constitution would bring it into line with the growing trend in many countries that have revised their con constitutions to include economic, social and cultural rights. 26 other EU states have made some form of constitutional provision for economic, social and cultural rights. And internationally, 106 constitutions protect the right to work. 133 provide the right to health care. Ireland is at the cusp of change, cultural and social change. People are calling for a more social justice-led future, an expansion on the protections of human rights. There is political will and social will in recognising these rights in our constitution. In February 2014, 85% of the members of the Constitutional Convention voted in favour of amending the constitution to strengthen the, economic, the protection of economic, social and cultural rights. A majority of members of the con Convention voted in favour of constitutional provision to progressively realise such rights subject to the maximum available resources and to enshrine, to enshrine that this duty be cognizable by the courts. The Convention further voted on whether specific additional rights should be enumerated in the Constitution and voted in favour of a proposal that all of the rights contained in the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights be enumerated within our Constitution. In March 2014, the Constitutional Convention sent a recommendation to the Government to implement these rights of which the government was due to respond by July of that year. Now, nearly a year later, we are still waiting for a response from the government to a pro proactively address the status of these rights. Political will also extends to the cor current government too. The Labour Party has introduced two private members' bills in this issue, one by Deputy Ruri Quinn in 2000, and the second, more recently, by Deputy Kevin Humphreys in 2012. Prevailing myths and misconceptions about economic, social and cultural rights combined with a lack of real political will, have hindered their application in Ireland. But these misconceptions don't stand up. 
The idea that ESC rights are only aspirations and not intended to be part of our judicial system are misconceived. Decisions in courts in other countries have proven time and again that these rights are legally enforceable. These rights have been recognised through a wide range of legal systems, found but not limited to Finland, Germany, Latvia, Portugal, Argentina, South Africa, India, Brazil, Kenya, Colombia and, Me Colombia and Mexico. Rights currently protected, such as freedom of expression, the right to privacy, are as broadly worded as ESC rights, but have not prevented the courts from adjudicating these issues. Another misconception is that the ESC rights would threaten the separation of powers, do not belong in the courts, and should be left to the legislature to, exec to execute. The fear here is that the elected governments and parliaments would not be free to allocate resources as they see fit. This, the concern expense extends to the belief that judges would be extending the role that these rights had to be defended in court, where policy making should be left to the elected policy makers, the government. However, a large body of case law on ESC rights has emerged from countries such as South Africa, showing that courts have remained conscious of their role when adju adjudicating ESC rights claims. A reasonableness doctrine was incorporated as a doctrine which has been held in legal and court proceedings. A third myth is that the state would not have the necessary resources to enforce the ESE rights, whereas civil and political rights do not. But this is misleading. Currently, civil and political rights may require expenditure of resources such as court costs, policing and provision of legal aid. And many ESC rights would save the exchequer costs, such as the prevent prevention of forced evictions. A fourth myth involves the civil and political and ESC rights impose different sets of obligations and ESC rights are consistently defined as positive rights, requiring the state to act in order to achieve the enjoyment of these rights, but again this is not accurate. The bill does not propose a cure for all social ills. It will not happen overnight and we have to be reasonable. These rights may not translate into an act, a statutory instrument or even a circular, but it will compel decision makers to vindicate these rights as far as they can. There is an underlying fear that these rights, if implemented, would bankrupt the nation to force the government to take drastic me measures to realise these rights. It won't. It won't mean overnight that the government must buy everyone a home. Progressive realisation is a key term here. The courts can apply principles of por proportionality and weigh it up against other policy considerations while the government can take into consideration the available resources. For example, if a right to housing was introduced, introduced, it wouldn't mean a person would be given a house to that effect, but it would mean that when the government is drafting housing policy or legislation, it would have to take into account and be aware of the right to housing. Right now, people can, can only argue their case on the basis of peripheral issues, such as unfair discrimination in procedures or the right to have the right to appeal decisions. They cannot target the fundamental issue, their right to adequate housing. It is intended to hold governments to account, not dismantle them so that if they don't have the resources, they will at least have to show how they came to the conclusions that they did. The phrase, subject to its maximum available resources, stated in the text, also emphasises this aspect. These rights are intended to define the parameters by which government can draft policy in, in economic, social and cultural areas, causing a trickle-down effect into every level of power. The context is right for constitutional change. The government has effectively announced the end of austerity from its point of view in its recent spring economic statements. The Constitutional Convention, designed by the current government, supports this change. Internationally, Ireland is a key speaker on human rights on the international platform, and through our long history working with developing countries in times of humanitarian crisis, we have consistently emphasised the importance of human rights. In June, the UN Expert, Expert Committee will objectively respond to submissions sent in by civil society organisations in Ireland. It is likely to reveal what we have always upheld, that the government has failed to use the recession to justify the failure to protect and progress human rights in Ireland, that there were disproportionate cuts to certain sectors, while human rights obligations weren't taken, weren't taken into account sufficiently. It will show that certain groups of people were not adequately protected, such as people with disabilities, carers, elderly people, lone parents and minority groups. In fact, people who are vulnerable to begin with. The general election is around the corner, which presents an opportunity for those currently in power to observe what people in Ireland really want from the next government. <coughs> and early next year, the 1916 centenary will be the cause for reflection for everyone in this country. We will be looking across the spectrum of the 100 years it has taken for this country to be where it is today. Will we be nostalgic or will we be proud? I urge the government to take a look around and observe the political context in which it finds itself, 
and respond to the people by to respond to the will of the people by supporting this bill. It has supported these principles before. It has even pushed for similar bills in the past. So there is no logical reason why the government would not vote on this, not in favour of this bill. It will have to justify its priorities once again. Thank you, Deputy. Just finishing up. Before I finish, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank Deputy Healy again for using his private time, member's time to allow me to introduce this bill. And I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Nick Henderson and Amnesty International, who have done a huge amount of work in this area, and Aidan Lloyd, Chair of the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Initiative, and all the organisations that have been involved in that initiative for pushing these rights to be re recognised into Irish law. And lastly, I would just like to thank Maeve Regan of the Mercy Law Resource Centre, whose work as a, as a lawyer and has provided clear examples of the need for economic, social and cultural rights so that people can defend their right to housing. Thank you.